I have the privilege of introducing two people who I hold in high esteem. The first is Dr. Sergio Aguilar Gaxiola. He is professor of clinical internal medicine, the founding director of the University of California Davis Center for Reducing Health Disparities, the director of the Community Engagement Program of the UC Davis Clinical Translational Science Research, and co-director of the National Institute of Aging, um, fund, of aging funded Latino Aging Research and Resource Center. And I thought establishing a new research center was enough work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola has nearly 30 years of experience working in the mental health field as a researcher, clinician, professor, and advocate. If I were to name all his stellar accomplishments, we would miss our dinner tonight. <laughs> Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola is truly an icon, renowned and respected at national and international levels. He has created a substantive applied research program that focuses on cross-cultural comparative epidemiologic research on patterns and correlates of mental health disorders, the identification of unmet health and mental health needs, and associated risk and protective factors in underserved populations community-engaged approaches to reducing health disparities and quality of care improvements, just to name a few. He has made a profound impact, not only through his genitive research and scholarship, but also by the generosity of his self, of his person, in mentoring young scholars and graduate students, including myself, what is so noteworthy for me is the quality of Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola's person. Es un hombre sincero y auténtico. And we are very privileged to welcome him this morning. The second speaker is Vicky Ivara, who is currently a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation doctoral fellow and doctoral candidate in political science at the University of New Mexico. Her research interests include health policy, the social determinants of health, immigrant policy, and Latino politics. She holds previous degrees in nursing and public health from the University of Washington. Prior to returning to school to pursue her doctoral degree, Ms. Ibarra worked for 21 years in healthcare as a public health nurse and administrator at the Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic. In addition, she served as Governor Gregoire's first chair of the Governor's Council on Health Disparities from 2006 to 2010. And in that role, she oversaw the development of Washington State's first state policy action plan to eliminate health disparities that was delivered to the governor and legislature in 2010. I first met Ms. Ivara two months after I arrived at the University of Washington School of Social Work in 2002 from Los Angeles. And so I went to Yakima Valley to visit different mental health providing organizations. One, to meet and introduce myself to the organizations, but also to get more sun. Yeah. <laughs> Vicki um, welcomed me to Washington State. She was happy that a Latino professor was now at the School of Social Work. But she made very clear the Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic did not want to partner with UW because of previous experiences with the University of Washington researchers who popped in, gathered their data, published, but leaving no tangible benefit for the organization or the residents. But every six weeks I returned to the valley and did the same circle of visits with the organizations. And a trusting relationship was forged over that time of face-to-face -face visits in that first year that has resulted in strong partnership with the Yakima Valley Farm Workers Clinic. And we are very grateful that Vicki um, is sharing her expertise with us this morning. So let's welcome Dr. Sergio Aguilar and Ms. Vicki Ivara.
Can you hear me? Yes. What a, what a lovely introduction. My God. I, I wish my mom to be here. <laughs> and my wife, because I need some uh, capital <laughs> as well. No, but I'm, I'm uh, buenos dias, antes que nada. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Really, really delighted because this is uh, just incredible that, uh, you know, Gino, Leo, and Nora, uh, you know, India, so many are involved in, in doing something that, as you mentioned, uh, Gino, uh, historic. And it's a privilege, really, and an honor to be here, to uh, be a part of it uh, and to uh, witness what uh, is happening here, you know. It's wonderful to have uh, the two talks, you know, by uh, our previous speakers and just to set the tone as to what uh, is going to happen for the rest of the program. But I'm really, really uh, honored and I'm very excited to uh, share the, 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 this session with uh, Vicky Barra, whose work I have, uh, you know, followed for many, many years uh, working with farm workers in the Yakima Valley. Because I, my, my work has been on migration and health uh, for over two decades. And I come from Mexico, you know, from the state of Sinaloa, which is the agricultural state. Um, and uh, since I was uh, very little, I was very much in touch with uh, lots of farm workers. So my experience, uh, you know, with farm workers goes back uh, to those days. So I'm uh, thrilled to be here uh, and uh, looking forward to uh, see the development and not only to see it, but to participate, to join you, to encourage you, to uh, promote you to, you know, whatever I can possibly do because this is an incredible effort, very worthy effort of something that, uh, you know, resonates very strongly with what you, you said, uh, with your impassioned, uh, you know, uh, welcome words, uh, that ya basta, you know, it is uh, too long for what is happening with Latinos and other underserved populations, not only Latinos, but uh, uh, we, are, we are focusing on Latinos today, and, and ya basta, you know, there are so many uh, disparities that we need to really pay attention and to deal with in in effective ways. So we we don't uh, you know meet again in 20 years or 30 years and say what progress have, have we made and to come to the conclusion that not much progress. So thrilled to be here. Uh, I have nothing to report. I'm clean. <laughs> But uh, I want to bring uh, greetings and news from California. Actually, um, great to be uh, uh, here in rainy Seattle. And I thought, you know, as I was looking through the window from the hotel this morning, I said, wouldn't it be great to collaborate even with the weather? You know, <laughs> that we need the rain. We really need the rain in California. We, we can bring you some sun. Uh, we have plenty of that, actually. Uh, so, or we can put uh, uh, both of us in a blender and see what happens. <laughs> but it's uh, it, 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 one, one great news that I want to bring uh, to you is that uh, as of last month, uh, we had been officially uh, majority in California. You know, this is, uh, this, is a, <laughs> this is a milestone. And what I, uh, I you know, I uh, want to share it with you because uh, we have a lot of work to do, especially in leadership positions. We need a lot of leaders uh, like uh, the ones that you have here, you know, who really make things happen uh, in a different way. So let me, let me uh, first, uh, how many of you work in the behavioral health area? Not, not all of you. So this is, this is good because what I can do is to try to do something almost impossible, to summarize in five minutes uh, or less uh, about 30 years of research on what we know about mental health, okay? I do quite a bit of work with the World Health Organization and the Pan-American Health Organization. I have been doing this for two decades this May, and uh, a lot of that work comes from that international uh, studies, national surveys that we have. So six things that I'm going to tell you about uh, why 
we ought to be looking about mental disorders. Why mental disorders and substance abuse matters, okay? One is that mental disorders are among the most uh, prevalent classes of chronic diseases in the general population. You know, if we are here, I don't know, 120 people or even uh, half of us are going to suffer from mental disorders in our lifetime, you know, and I, I'm convinced that no one escapes, either in yourself, your family, your friends, your neighbor, no one escapes. So just by the sheer numbers, this is uh, of critical importance. The other thing is that they, uh, the comorbidities that happen, you know, they conquer within themselves. And I'm going to illustrate this with two slides. Uh, uh, but also with substance abuse, and now we have emerging information that they uh, uh, also uh, coexist with uh, chronic uh, or with health conditions, physical conditions, as I will illustrate as well. So comorbidity is the rule. The third thing is that typically mental uh, disorders uh, start early in life. You know, this is uh, uh, by age uh, 14, 50% of the most severe mental illnesses show up. By age 24, 75% of the most severe. Uh, uh, my, my colleague, and uh, uh, I had been collaborating for 20, 20 years, uh, Ron Kessler, uh, say, calls them the chronic conditions of the youth, mental disorders, because they occur early. And if nothing is, do is being done about, about them, they don't go away. You know, actually, they, there can be very negative uh, consequences. So those three things... Uh, uh, three more things, and then I'm going to give a little bit more details. One is that they are among the most uh, chronic, uh, uh, excuse me, disabling of all the chronic health conditions. And I will illustrate this point uh, uh, in, in a slide as well. Also, very costly. I, I just uh, keep that in mind. is billions of dollars, if, uh, especially in lost productivity, but also in the tremendous disability that it causes if you don't do anything about it, you know? If someone suffers from diabetes, uh, uh, five times more likely to also suffer from depression. And if you don't deal with depression, then the control of diabetes is, uh, is in question, you know? Last one is the one that I will focus on for the rest of the talk. Only a minority with mental health needs received treatment in the previous year. And that's the treatment gap that I would like to focus on. So let me get started. Comorbidity, about uh, 40 to 65 of those reporting a lifetime substance disorder had at least one other psychiatric disorder. They coexist very frequently. 51 reporting one or more psychiatric disorders uh, also report at least one substance abuse. 23% had three or more lifetime disorders. This comes from a national survey that Ron Kessler has done uh, called the National Comorbidity Survey. Uh, replication, and he has been doing this for three decades now, is the one that feeds us the information that informs the nation uh, in terms of mental health issues. So the other one, and, and this is, uh, I was fascinated with, uh, with your talk, um, really, I, I think that it, you put it so nicely. And one of the issues that I didn't go unnoticed is that in your visits, about 4% are for mental uh, behavioral health, you know. Pay attention to that because of the comorbidities, you know. This is just, just to have a sense, uh, you know, chronic physical pain, cancer, neurologic disorders, diabetes, uh, smoking, obesity, physical inactivity, how they interface, they co-occur with the mental illness. Age of onset, I already commented to you, you know, that uh, the most serious uh, usually mental disorders usually begin in childhood or adolescence. Uh, they are usually not severe when they begin, so we can intervene early, and we can uh, really uh, be able to curb, you know, some of the effects that it may that that may happen. Uh, there there are several uh, pieces of uh, uh, data in that regard, but we usually don't do it because we don't recognize them. You know, especially Latinos, we are notable for not uh, knowing what's going on with us, even if we are falling apart, you know, especially, let's say, depression. 
uh, typically become severe over time. And I already, uh, one thing that is of critical importance is that early onset mental disorders are significant predictors of the subsequent onset and persistence of physical disorders. This is cascading, okay? So if someone suffers from, <clears throat> let's say, depression, and that is not being treated, this is going to get, uh, you know, complicated with other chronic conditions, okay? And uh, uh, we have done a lot of work internationally about this. I have published a lot also. And what I can tell you, one of the things that was uh, re remarkable is that the strongest predictor of the early, early onset mental disorders and separately, uh, early on, uh, the, the uh, premature aging, you know, that happens, the onset also of chronic health conditions was childhood adversities. Childhood adversities, trauma, no? If kids early in life experience any kind of abuse, you know, physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, they experience uh, domestic violence at home. Or uh, if there is a suicide in the family or the parents suffer from substance abuse uh, or uh, if uh, suffer from mental disorders. You know, all of these are childhood adversities that lead into these uh, negative, uh, you know, consequences uh, early in life. So uh, keep that in mind. This is, this is very telling, you know, the great uh, global burden of disease uh, that, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, that uh, the World Health Organization commissioned to the School of Public Health at Harvard uh, back in 1996 put mental health in the map of public health. Up to then, we were using basically mortality and morbidity uh, as indicators of public health. Well, uh, this, the global burden of disease, put disability also as the third indicator. And when you consider disability, then uh, five uh, of the top ten most disabling disorders are mental disorders. Number one, and we have seen in our own data over and over again, you know, from Nigeria uh, to uh, Colombia to Mexico to Peru to Brazil, over and over again, number one is mental, is, is, is major depression. Uh, I do, already told you that all five mental disorders show up by age 24, the chronic conditions of the youth. Okay? So this is what brings me today, you know, is uh, to focus on what happens when people are suffering from these so frequent disorders and are they being treated? You know, what happens to Latinos? Uh, also when they suffer with these disorders. Well, this is at the, at the national level. And met need, those not receiving specialist or generalist care in the past 12 months, uh, uh, about 70%, you know, in the U.S. don't receive, uh, 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 um, you know, treatment. So it is only about uh, 30% that receive any kind of treatment. But this gets worse, you know, we, we conducted a study in the Central Valley in California, um, and what we found is that these are people of Mexican origin, and those who were needing services because they suffer from one or more disorders in the last 12 months, about one out of three of the U.S. born received care, one out of six of the immigrants, and then we had a sample of over 1,000 uh, farm workers, you know, Less than one in 10 was uh, receiving services. So tremendous differences. And, and this is something that has to be kept in mind as well. This is in Washington. You know, Hank Valderrama, who I'm hoping uh, will be here, so I can say hello to my good friend. You know, he sent me this report uh, a, a few months ago about a, a study done by the State Depart Washington State Department of Social and Health Services. <coughs> They call it the disparity study, and look at what uh, what uh, what what is uh, you know uh, reported that Hispanics had the lowest uh, non-crisis outpatient utilization rate, indicating a concern about their access to needed services. This is your data here in the state, and it looks like this: this is community non-crisis outpatient utilization rate, and uh, Hispanic are notable because of the, of the uh, low rates, okay? But it is not only that. There are other, oh, one, one implication is that the involvement of the stakeholders knowledgeable about Hispanic member 
needs and engagement strategies will be key to any disparity reduction efforts. We academicians have to learn lessons that we haven't learned so far. And that is, let's go to the sources and ask them, what, is, what, what are their needs? You know, what, what matters to them? And, and to start from there, there you know, in order to make uh, the changes that are needed. The other thing is this one right here. This is percentage of consumers serving a culture-specific programs. This is uh, related to what Nina was talking about, cultural centeredness. This is, this is to cry, you know, in a state in which there are quite a bit of uh, Latinos, and it's increasing as well. So uh, uh, there is a lot of work to do. It is uh, what you are about to, uh, you know, officially establish is very much needed, okay? And, and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> so people ask me often, uh, you know, in the years that you have been doing research here uh, in the U.S. and, and internationally, uh, what are the key issues of, in Latino uh, mental health? And, and, you know, there are five A's that I want to bring to your attention. And it's very likely that this is not news for you, but it is access to care. You know, that's a big issue and continues to be a big issue nationwide. Uh, once they get into, the other one is that uh, often Latinos don't have money to pay for the services or they don't have employment that provides them uh, with uh, health coverage. So affordability is a, is a big issue. But the other ones are availability of the services, appropriateness, which speaks to um, uh, cultural issues and language issues. You know, there are studies that uh, show that when it comes to Latinos who make it into the door of services, they don't return uh, up to 75%, don't return for a second time. And boy, if you go to some you know, hospitals, especially in clinics, immediately you would notice why, you know. It all starts when you walk into the, the room with the whole family, which is what happens with Latinos. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they see, they look at you and say, wow, are you bringing this army of people, you know. And, and people want water, they want to go to the restroom, you know. <laughs> and they get this, this, this uh, evil eye, you know kind of looking at why so many people you know as it happened to me when I was in Fresno I lived there for a few years and I had my own private practice on Saturdays and Sundays and my colleagues would say your 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 families fill up all the lobby you know <laughs> and the cookies that we have you know are taken by them so I learned to buy uh, cookies and to you know and to have them pl in plenty but, you know, they, these are some of the messages that are being sent, okay? Okay, this brings me to something that we have done in the last several years in California. This is called the uh, California Reducing Disparities Project, Community Defined Solutions for Reducing Mental Health Disparities in Latinos specifically. And what I want to share with you something very specific that really uh, keeps me very excited. You know, I went to dinner with Nina, with uh, Julie, and with... Um, Lisa uh, last night, and I was telling them about how excited I am about this. And, and Nina came early, you know, and, and was with one of the retreats that we had uh, in, the, in this process. So this is a California Reducing Disparities project. The main goal is to develop a statewide comprehensive, uh, comprehensive strategic plan based in five populations. We focus on African Americans, Asian Pacific Islanders, Latinos, LGBTQ, and Native American populations. We created population reports. All those reports were brought together by another entity, and they created a strategic plan at the state level. And there are $60 million that are earmarked uh, to, to, to work with this notion of community-defined promise and practices, models, and resources or approaches. This is money that is going to go to communities. We have been fighting, uh, fighting a lot. I was going to use, I was going to curse, but <laughs> <laughs> fighting a lot. And, and because we want to keep these resources to the communities directly, not to the counties, 
not to the big, big, uh, you know, uh, think tanks. These are the CBOs, you know, that are struggling uh, to, to, to get by. And we, we, it seems that we are going to be able to do that. Uh, so uh, this is uh, to contribute uh, culturally relevant recommendations for each ethnic cultural group to develop a comprehen comprehensive statewide strategy uh, planned towards the reduction of mental health disparities. Uh, this is, uh, 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 we tackle, our center tackle the Latino uh, strategic uh, uh, partner uh, work group, we called it. Uh, the main goal was to produce a community-defined, strength-based, cultural and linguistically appropriate report on reducing disparities in mental health services for Latinos. Uh, we went up and down the state to do community forums and asking people, the sources directly, in a, in a full day, uh, things that we wanted to know that we didn't know, you know, and, and Nina was uh, in a critical meeting that we had of uh, about 30 people that we call the Concilio. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me move very quickly because Megan already gave me uh, the... This is, uh, these are the reports, okay? We came up with six strategic directions uh, improve access to, do the, to, to deal with the five uh, A's that I was telling you. And these are the estra six strategic directions. What I'm floor about it is that uh, Ventura County, you know, took exactly the framework that we were, you know, uh, putting forward, and they are working on it beautifully, you know. And I have had four trips uh, to Ventura County to work with uh, not only the director of uh, behavioral health, but also the board of supervisors, uh, 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 city managers, and especially community members that they say and, and said exactly what uh, Gino said. Ya basta. We had been with these lat disparities in Latinos in a county that is 41%, and the capital, Oxnard, is about 75% Latinos. So they say, ya basta. We need to do something about it. So what they did is, this is a strategic direction too, faith-based collaborations, co-located integrated primary care. One that is, I'm fascinated, is the Mixteco Indigena, uh, uh, Indigena Community Organization Project is called MICOP uh, or MICOP. It, they have all of these uh, things already ongoing, you know, training, outreach and education, and engagement, education, violence prevention. I was there and I was fascinated by that, the things that they are doing. What we need to do, <clears throat> and I'm going to be on Monday again in Oxnard, and then El Cinco de Mayo, I'm going to be there again, um, is to evaluate these efforts in a way that we really can demonstrate that uh, it, these are effective. So the public monies are going to something that is effective. Okay? So, uh, two more slides. In conclusions, mental health disparities uh, in Latino uh, access to care exist uh, they clearly exist in the U.S. They are major public health problems should be seen in the context of a growing demographic diversity. Uh, they lead to significant burden of advent mental disorders. It translates into all of these issues, you know, uh, ill health, premature death, etc. the things that I was telling you about. So, uh, uh, you know, there are implications for policy and practice. I won't uh, uh, state too much, but the uh, uh, raise awareness and understanding of disparities in uh, recruitment and retention strategy for culturally and linguistically diverse staff. So let me, let me stop with this. If you build it, will they come? Well, I'm not convinced because we are continuing to operate in the waiting mode. You know? Here we construct these wonderful medical centers or, or hospitals or clinics, and we are waiting for people to come to us. How about we, we do it differently? How, how about if we go after them? Okay? So, uh, well, it depends on who builds it, and people pay attention to that. How is it built? Where is it built? And why is it built? Thank you so much, and looking forward to your, your questions.